You have been lied to. The proofs for God's existence aren't what you think they are. And the truth is that they point to something far more shocking and profound. And we're going to reveal exactly what that is. When we talk about proofs for God's existence, most people immediately think of a theistic God, like the kind of God you'd find in religious books, who's all knowing, all powerful, and all loving. But what if I told you that these proofs are actually pointing to something else entirely, something that could shatter your understanding of reality, something that's been hidden right under our noses. We're going to look at three proofs for the existence of God. And for centuries, people have been using these arguments to claim that God's existence is undeniable. But we're about to unravel the real story behind these proofs and reveal a secret that's been kept from you for far too long. A secret that will utterly change the way you understand yourself, your life, and existence forever. Remember to like and subscribe. My channel is about raising consciousness to create a new world. And when you hit the like button, it helps spread this information. So take a second to hit it now. Also, make sure you follow my podcast on Spotify, Dawn of the New Earth, and check out my new book, Neogenesis, Dawn of the New Mind, available on Amazon right now. Links are in the description. I'm an ex-Christian that spent years uncovering the nature of reality, and people probably expect me to simply debunk these arguments, but the truth behind these proofs contain some of the most important revelations that you'll ever encounter. We're starting with one of the most famous arguments for the existence of God, known as the cosmological argument. This argument argument has a long history with roots in the work of ancient philosophers like Aristotle and later developed by Thomas Aquinas. So what exactly is the cosmological argument? At its core, it's about causation. The argument goes something like this. Everything that begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist. Therefore, the universe must have a cause. Now, this seems pretty straightforward. The first premise is based on the principle of causality, which we see in our everyday lives. Nothing just pops into existence without a reason. If you see a new plant in your garden, well, you know it came from a seed. If you hear a noise in your house, you start looking for what caused that noise. In simple terms, anything that begins must have something that started it. The second premise is simply that the universe began to exist. Modern science, particularly in the Big Bang Theory, says that the universe began about 13.8 billion years ago. All matter, energy, space, and time sprang into existence from a singularity. But here's where things get really interesting. If everything that begins needs something to start it, and the universe had a beginning, well, then something had to have started the universe. But what could this something be? What is the cause? Now, here's where the argument traditionally points to God, a necessary uncaused cause that exists outside of time and space and brought everything into existence. This is actually a pretty strong argument, but hold on a second. Think about this. Does this cause have to be a personal God, like the God described in the Bible or other religious books? This proof doesn't say anything about a loving God that has a personal relationship with people. It just says that everything that begins to exist must have a cause, and thus something must have caused the universe. So what exactly is the cosmological argument pointing to? What is is it that actually caused the universe? Well, we're going to discover exactly what that cause is. But before going further, let's explore the teleological argument, also known as the argument from design. Now, as an ex-Christian, the teleological argument was driven into my head as proof for the existence of the Christian God. And it's considered by many to be one of the most intuitive and convincing proofs for God's existence. So what is the teleological argument? Well, this argument is all about design and purpose. It says that the universe is so complex and well-ordered that it must have been designed by someone. William Paley, an 18th century philosopher, explained this with his watchmaker analogy. So think about it like this. If you find a watch on the ground, you wouldn't think it just appeared there by chance, right? You'd assume that someone designed it and made it. Well, the teleological argument applies the same logic to the universe. It points out that the universe has complex laws, patterns, and systems that work together perfectly and so concludes that there must be an intelligent designer behind it all. Now, this seems powerful, but hold on and think about this. What the teleological argument does is provide evidence that the universe is ordered and structured. It certainly doesn't prove the existence of a theistic God, like the God of Christianity. What if this incredible order and complexity that we see are the result of something else entirely? Well, we're going to find out what's really responsible for the ordered structure of existence. But there's one more argument we need 
need to explore. Now, this is one of the more challenging arguments to understand, but it's actually one of the most powerful and important, the ontological argument. Now, this argument is different from the others because it doesn't rely on physical evidence or observations of the natural world. Instead, it's based purely on logic and reason. The ontological argument was first proposed by Anselm in the 11th century, but we're gonna take a look at the philosopher Norman Malcolm's modern take on the argument. So here's a simplified explanation. Malcolm distinguishes between two kinds of existence, contingent things, which are things that exist but could also not exist. For example, Take the Earth. The Earth exists, but you could imagine a theoretical universe where it didn't exist. The Earth does exist, but it's not something that has to exist. Something is contingent if it depends on something else for its existence. Think of a house. A house is contingent because it needs builders, materials, and a place to be built. If any of those things didn't happen, the house wouldn't exist. It relies on outside factors. Now, in contrast to contingent existence, there is necessary existence. So, necessary Necessary existence is something that must exist and cannot not exist, and it doesn't depend on anything else. For example, mathematical truths necessarily exist. A statement like 2 plus 2 equals 4, in base 10 of course, is true and cannot be false. No matter what, it's always true and has to be true, and it doesn't need anything else other than itself to be true. So Malcolm's argument starts with the idea that if God exists, well, God is a necessary being. This means if God exists, he has to exist, just like two plus two always equals four, no matter what. So, Malcolm argues, if it's even possible that God exists, then he has to exist necessarily. This is because a necessary by definition must exist if it's possible at all. So according to Malcolm, since the concept of God isn't logically impossible, it means God's existence is necessary, therefore God exists. But let's take a step back and ask, does this argument necessarily prove the existence of a personal God, or is it actually pointing to something else entirely? See, this argument points to the fact that something has to exist, that it would be impossible for that something to not exist. But what is that something? Now, these arguments are powerful, but many people leap to the conclusion that they prove a specific personal loving God. Now, not everyone believes this, and they understand that these proofs aren't pointing to a personal God, but many people do make that leap. And this isn't just a stretch, it's totally fallacious. It's like this. Imagine that you were walking along the beach and you saw a mark in the sand. Not like a footprint or anything, just some kind of mark. Well, what does this mark tell you? It simply means that someone or something made the mark. But it would be totally flawed to immediately jump to the conclusion that the mark in the sand proved that a specific person, like Abraham Lincoln, made the mark. So likewise, the three arguments that we're exploring are powerful, but they say absolutely nothing about a God who created the earth in six days and had a son named Jesus who died for your sins. Just because there's a first cause and that reality exhibits order and something must have necessary existence in no way proves the existence of a specific entity or its traits like being all loving, all knowing, or involved in our personal lives. But humans are constantly projecting human qualities onto non-human things. So now that we know something about these three arguments, let's discover the truth. What are they actually revealing? Well, what if they prove nothing? I mean, literally nothing. What I mean is, what if the true ground of all existence is nothingness? Not in the sense of empty void, but in the mathematical concept of zero. This isn't an empty zero, but full, containing all mathematical values that balance to zero. Think of it like this. Don't think of zero as being empty, but as a state of perfect balance. In mathematical terms, zero can be seen as containing all numbers. Why? Well, think about it. If you add positive one and negative one, they balance out to zero. The same goes for positive two and negative two, positive 100 and negative 100, and on and on. All these pairs of numbers exist within the concept of zero because they sum up to nothing. They don't destroy each other, it's a perfect balance. It's a dynamic equilibrium where everything cancels out perfectly. So this kind of zero isn't an absence of existence. Instead, it's a state that contains all possibilities, all values, but in such a balanced way that they all add up to zero. It's like having all potential positive and negative energies in the universe, but arranged in a way that they neutralize each other completely. In other words, this is not a physical reality, but a mathematical reality that perfectly balances to zero.
let me explain. Remember the cosmological argument? It talks about the need for a cause for the universe. Well, traditionally, this cause is seen as God, but what if the cause of the universe is actually zero, nothingness, a state of perfect mathematical balance? Think about this. Everything that begins to exist needs a cause. Well, the universe began to exist, so it needs a cause, but what about nothingness. Nothingness, in terms of the concept of zero, doesn't need anything external to exist. Mathematical truths are timeless and eternal. They have always existed and will always exist. Nothingness, in this mathematical sense, is eternal. But here's the fascinating part. Mathematics can be rearranged to give rise to the universe. Imagine it like a perfect computer code that gives rise to a complex video game world. See, before the universe began, there was a state of nothingness, not an empty void, but a zero state where all potential positive and negative values balanced perfectly. The Big Bang was a fluctuation in this balanced zero state, where mathematical values arranged in a specific pattern that led to the creation of the universe. Okay, but if that's true, well, who did the arranging? Well, this brings us to the teleological argument, which says that the complexity of the universe points towards a designer. But think about this, the order and complexity we see in the world are the natural results of a mathematical reality. Of course, a mathematical reality is going to exhibit structure. The order and patterns we observe from the spiral of galaxies to the structure of atoms are manifestations of this underlying mathematical order. This doesn't need a conscious designer, but it's instead the inevitable outcome of a balanced mathematical framework that self-organizes everything perfectly according to its internal unfolding. Here's another way to understand this. An intelligent designer, especially one who's supposed to be all-knowing and all-powerful, doesn't make sense when we think about all the problems with our bodies and the world around us. Our bodies have a lot of imperfections. We have back pain because our spines are not well adapted to upright walking, our eyes have blind spots, and many people need corrective lenses just to see properly. Now, some people try to explain this away by saying it's because of sin, but does that really make sense? Would a perfect designer really create a system with so many inherent flaws? Laws. But these imperfections make perfect sense when you consider the idea of a mathematical reality that is constantly experimenting and exploring all its transformations. This fits in perfectly with the theory of evolution. Evolution explains how life forms, adapts, and changes over time through natural selection, where traits that improve survival are passed on to future generations. Well, this process, it's not guided by an intelligent designer, but is a result of natural mathematical laws at work. But what about the ontological argument? It states that a necessary being must exist. But let's apply this to the idea of a mathematical reality. This necessary being isn't about a personal deity, but the mathematical laws of existence. When explaining the ontological argument and necessary existence, we already saw that mathematical truths are inherently necessary. They are timeless, unchanging, and universal. It is impossible for mathematical principles to not exist. Denying the existence of mathematical truths leads to logical contradictions. For example, if we say that two plus two does not equal four, well, we get a contradiction. Mathematical truths must exist to avoid logical inconsistencies, and zero represents the state of perfect balance that underpins everything. See, mathematics explains all these arguments perfectly. We live in a reality of self-transforming mathematical nothingness, constantly exploring its own patterns. This mathematical framework is not an empty void, but full of potential, capable of giving rise to the universe and all its complexities. But how do we know that this is true? Well, first we have to ask ourselves, how are we going to understand existence? Through faith or reason? If we choose faith, arguments don't matter. But if we accept that reason reveals truth, then we can see that rationally, mathematics and the concept of zero has to exist. Logically, it must. It can't not exist. When we use reason correctly, it leads us to truths that are undeniable. For example, two plus two equals four, that's not just an opinion. It's a truth based on logical consistency and necessity. So if we accept that reason and logic reveal truth, this is how we can know that zero exists because logically, it has to. In other words, logically speaking, existence must exist 
it can't not exist, and mathematics perfectly balanced to zero provides a coherent and logical foundation for understanding the universe. It removes the need for an unnecessary leap to a theistic god and instead offers a framework where everything is interconnected through the principles of balance and symmetry. So if you've been told that these arguments prove the existence of a theistic god like I was, you've been lied to or at least misled by someone that doesn't know what they're talking about or what these proofs are actually saying. This is not a reality built by a theistic god. It's not even a physical reality. We are part of a mathematical reality, a self-transforming nothingness that continuously explores and manifests its inherent patterns and structures. But here's where it gets even more fascinating. Going further, we can discover that we are those mathematical patterns. In other words, we are the universe exploring its own mathematical possibilities. This leads us to the realization that we are God, not in the traditional sense of a theistic God, but in the sense as the ultimate ground of reality, exploring its own mathematical patterns. This awareness and ability to question and understand is part of the awakening universe's exploration of its own nature through us. But that's a topic for another video, and you can understand more about it in the Neogenian system of metarationalism. Make sure you like this video and subscribe. Check out my other videos. And if you wanna help my channel grow, become a member on Patreon or YouTube to access all of our members only videos. And I wanna give a big shout out to everyone who supports. My name is Morg and I am Neogenian.